Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, Ralph Ellison and Battle Royal, which is a cutting from his novel Invisible Man. Um, so to start off here a little bit, um, Ralph Ellison, he was born in uh, Oklahoma City and uh, grew up in, uh, I guess that's technically the South. Uh, they call it the South, but I lived in Oklahoma. I don't know about all that. I think it's more like the Midwest. But um, it is has a lot in, in common with the South. Uh, born in Oklahoma City, came of age during the Jim Crow era, which we've talked about, uh, the era of institutionalized and rampant racism. Um, he wrote uh, the seminal novel, Invisible Man, uh, of which Battle Royal is the first chapter, okay? Now, it's important to know that um, he never really wrote much of anything else in his lifetime. So essays here and there, a couple things. Uh, but for the most part, he was caretaker, kind of like um, Harper Lee with To Kill a Mockingbird. I mean, if you write a stone classic, kind of hard to follow that up, you know? So, so uh, he only wrote the one uh, novel, which was Invisible Man. And so, uh, because people really wanted a lot more of his stuff, that's when people started doing cuttings. And that's where we get Battle Royal, okay? That this is the first chapter of that novel. Now, here's a note, okay? If you are going to look at this story, okay, uh, for any kind of, for any reason to, to, to write about it, and you're doing research, uh, do not research The Invisible Man, Okay. The Invisible Man is a novel written by H.G. Wells in the late 19th century about a guy that's literally invisible, okay? You may have seen the movie. It's like old black and white. The guy with, like, the stuff wrapped around his face and the glasses. That's The Invisible Man, okay? That's a science fiction classic, different book altogether, okay? Um, uh, Invisible Man is is uh, more of a... Um, the fact that the, that the narrator doesn't have a name... Uh, just kind of illustrates how um, anonymous he is, really. He, he, he is a metaphorically invisible, okay? So, um, but Battle Royal, though, um, if we're going to look at this and kind of take it apart, you know, what what time does it take place in? It doesn't really tell us much. Um, it, it certainly does. It seems like it's the mid-20th century. Um, uh, and, you know, if, if you're not told otherwise, that the today of the story is uh, the the year that's that's given at the end of the story, and in this case, it's um, 1950. What is it? 1952. Yeah, 1952. I thought it was 57. So so you could. It's mid 20th century, so we're about right. Um, where does it take place? Probably the South. We don't really know exactly where, but it seems like it's it. Um, certainly, uh, again. Writers use their own lives as kind of background, so it would make sense if he were in the South, but but know that this sort of behavior was, was rampant over the entire country, not just the South, to be a little fair to the South. Uh, the, the, they don't give him much credit, but, you know, don't give him much slack, but but it was almost all over the entire country. Um, so... Uh, there are a few clues, but but it could be anywhere. So if it could be almost anywhere, that's kind of the point, right? You know, if they don't specify a certain specific place, then it almost could be anywhere. I mean, I, I mean anywhere in the United States. So this it wouldn't take place in another part of the world. This is clearly a United States problem. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if you but if you think about the setting, about where the, the the actual what happens in the action where it is located think about the place where the battle is happening okay think about like put like a like the drone shot over what this looks like and you have what you see is a ring okay a square ring a boxing ring fight ring full of young black men okay like a sort of like a, a segment of the black community perhaps representing a segment of the black community okay uh, surrounded by this crowd of rich white people, specifically rich white men who are drunk and smoking cigars and lecherous, but the, the point's well taken. You know, where do you see this borne out over the entire country? It's almost like an inner city, right? Where you have the inner city is typically um, a, a lot browner than the suburbs, okay? And, um, and, the, and typically, there's a lot of violence there for a lot of reasons other than the fact that they're brown, even though some people would like you to think that that's true. Um, this is certainly what happens, okay? Uh, this certainly happened in the mid-century when th they built the uh, interstate um, 
the interstate system. Um, uh, they thought that they were going to bring people to the cities, but what it did was it emptied out the middle of the cities, and people that could leave the city uh, went to the suburbs. And that's why inner city these days is, is, uh, is shorthand for uh, blighted neighborhood or, or neighborhoods of color. Okay, so, so th that's where th this comes from. But you kind of see this in this story, don't you, a little bit? Um, and you also see the violence that happens in the community uh, for very few resources. Okay, in this particular case, the resource would be this, um, the money that's out there, the, the respect. I don't know. I mean, the, the fact that you won. Uh, I'm not really sure what, what you're going to win in this particular story. But, um, but, but think about how this takes place. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about the grandfather, okay? Because uh, he's important. The very first part of this story, much like everyday use, starts with a, with a, with a, with a grandparent. And in this particular one, I'm just going to read from this, from this one. Um, if you want to read along, it's, in, uh, it's on page 152 um, of our book. And it's in the middle of that bottom paragraph. But my grandfather is the one. He was an odd old guy, my grandfather, and I'm told I take after him. I was, it was he who caused the trouble. On his deathbed, he called my father to him and said, Son, after I'm gone, I want you to keep up the good fight. I never told you, but our life is a war, and I have been a traitor all my born days, a spy in the enemy's country ever since I give up my gun back in the Reconstruction. Live with your head in the lion's mouth. I want you to overcome them with yeses, undermine them with grins, agree them to death and destruction. Let them swallow you till they vomit you or bust wide open. They vomit or bust wide open. Okay. On the next page on 153, it continues um, a little bit here in the middle of that, uh, that big paragraph in the middle of the page. And whenever things went well for me, the narrator, I remembered my grandfather and I felt guilty and uncomfortable. It was as though I was carrying out his advice in spite of myself, and to make it worse, everyone loved me for it. I was praised by the most lily-white men of the town. I was considered an example of desirable conduct, just as my grandfather had been, and what puzzled me was that the old man had defined it as treachery. Okay? Now, what do you think about that? All right? What is it about this grandfather? And again, to go back to the idea of, of legacy, um, uh, and family and generational conflict, that sort of stuff, that this um, would, be, would be relevant here, okay? Uh, is that it, and how is it to, res how is resisting and being agreeable or being agreeable, how is that a tactic to win a war? I mean, that doesn't sound like any kind of war I would ever win, right? Does that sound also like, a, like, a, like a, something you've heard other places too, like maybe Gandhi or uh, nonviolence? Right, um, uh, Henry uh, Henry David Thoreau, um, uh, civil disobedience. Okay, so it do, it, so it does it, it is sort of talks about that. But um, let's talk about the character for a second. So so why is he a traitor? What's the war? How do you win by being agreeable? And there's some kind of trouble. He was the start of the trouble. I'm not really sure what trouble we're talking about. Um, the narrator is a is a young idealistic black man, very smart, perhaps even a little naive. Um, at the beginning of the story, because he certainly doesn't really know what he's getting himself into. Um, uh, we'll talk a minute about the uh, about the, uh, the 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 crowd of men in the town, the lily white men of the town, but um, um, uh, and the young black men in the center are sort of symbolic of the community at large. But um, what do you make about the whore? Okay, well, okay, the white woman who is clearly supposed to be a whore. She's naked. Um, she's clearly painted up to be a harlot. She's trotted out there, and she's being, the men are being forced to look at her, okay? Now, what makes it kind of over the top as a symbol here is that she's got this tattoo of the American flag. I mean, ding, 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 come on. I mean, she's, you know, she's a symbol of something, not necessarily America, but maybe the American dream, because these, these boys are looking at her, they're being forced to look at her, and if they're getting, you know, sexually aroused, because, you know, that's what happens when you're a young man and you see this kind of stuff. But had any one of them, and they're being encouraged to and forced to do it by the men they thought was hilarious. So, so if any one of these men would have would have acted on those impulses in 1952, would have been instantly lynched. Okay, I mean this is three years before Emmett Till in 1955. He and he was allegedly lynched for well, I'm sorry, lynched for allegedly whistling at a white woman. So, um, which has been proven to be false. So, um. So, so she is is emblematic of of the Amer American dream or or something, right? That 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 there's that you're supposed to be desire. What does it mean to desire something? 
And the sexual desire is just sort of symbolic of the really deep-seated desire of, for something that you will never be able to get, okay? Think about the bitterness that that could, that could foster in somebody, right? But, but on page um, 154, uh, they mentioned right down towards the bottom of the page, they were all there, bankers, lawyers, judges, doctors, fire chiefs, teachers, merchants, even one of the more fashionable pastors. Now they could have he could have just said, you know, they were all there, all the all the leaders of the town. Okay? And that would have been, you know, the same thing, right? Um all of the big muckety mucks in town, something. Okay? All the important men of the town were there. But he mentions bankers, specifically these groups of people. And if you think about it, it's everything, every institution that you have to be a part of to live in this country, right? Banking, money, right? Lawyers and judges, the the uh, legal system, doctors, medicine, right? Fire chiefs, uh, the, uh, public services, teachers, education, business with merchants, um, and even the preachers. I mean, they have got it locked down, right? So, so that's the point of mentioning those. That's why the language, if you look really closely at these things, sometimes it renders all of this really rich detail that's here for a reason. Okay. Now, um, the other thing I want to talk about, because once they go through this, and if you think about it, they're, they're going through this fight, and they're not encouraged to fight together. You know, I mean, he even tries to like say, hey, like survivor, hey, let's work together and try to get off. You know, but it's like, no, it's every man for himself. <clears throat> and if we're going to go with this metaphor, if this is like the black community, you know, and let's say there's only one scholarship, you know, for this kid to get out. What happens to everybody that's left there? You know, where's the hope? There is there any hope? You know, what happens to the people in this particular uh, fight, this battle royal, who didn't make it out? W what do they do now? You know, so so it it, it it gets you thinking about kind of, you know, how free are you? You know, if you're only free as as you're allowed to be in a lot of ways, and that's kind of what what um what what this is going here because the the takeaway is is that they don't want you working together. Because if you work together, you could be stronger. They don't want you. Um, they don't want us to realize that we're all being held down by the same foot on our neck. That they want us fighting each other. They want. They want it to be to be adversarial. And this is exactly kind of speaks to that. Okay. Um, but towards the end of the story, where where he where he starts telling his giving his speech, and um, and he starts saying some things. And th I'm gonna read this one little speech here on page 163, top of 163. Um, when he starts talking, we of the younger generation extol the wisdom of that great leader and educator, I shouted, who first spoke these flaming words of wisdom. A ship lost at sea for many days, suddenly sighted a friendly vessel. From the mast of the unfortunate vessel came a, a, a what was seen a signal. Water, water, we die of thirst. The answer from the friendly vessel came back. Cast down your bucket where you are. The captain of the distressed vessel, at last heeding the injunction, cast down his bucket, and it came up full of fresh, sparkling water from the mouth of the Amazon River. And like him, I say, and in his words, to those of my race who, de who depend upon bettering their condition in the foreign land, blah, 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 blah. Okay? Cast down your buckets where you are. What ideology is that? I mean, think about this story. Okay? Who is the ship? Right, the the ship is distressed. We're, we're we're thirsty. We're thirsty. We're thirsty. Okay, and they see land, and there's some people on the land, and the people on the land are like, oh, "Stop, right there." Okay, w what do you need? What do you need? Okay, well we need water. We're dying of thirst. Okay, all right. Well, if you need water, let me tell you what you need to do. Okay, stay right where you are. Just drop your bucket down right there. Okay, right. Smell it. It's fresh water. Great. You guys are okay? Great. No need to come any closer. Stay right there. Go with God. Okay? What ideology is that? Certainly during the Jim Crow era. Separate but equal, is it not? Okay? Where it's like, you're, you've got your need met. There's no need for us to mingle now. OK, and um, and that's kind of where we are, certainly at the, at the time here. And, and, and this is 1952. But is it really ancient history? I mean, come on. I mean, look at where we are right now. Um, uh, it's really kind of kind of kind of sad, you know. But when he's finally, you know, and, and the men are getting a kick out of this. Right. This is like watching a monkey recite Shakespeare or something. You know, they, they think it's a hilarious. But then he goes a little too far. 
he says the word equality. And you can hear the record go, Erg! <laughs> you know, and they're like, what did you say? And he says, uh, uh, racial or justice. No, it was, it was equality. What is it about equality that scares what would be called the hegemony here? Hegemony is a, is a, is a fancy word that means the uh, ruling group of people. In this case, it would be you know, older white um, gentlemen of this town would be the hegemony. What scares the hegemony about, about equality? Here's equality, right? Here's the status quo, where things are. Here are the underclasses. They get to equality. That's great, isn't it? Why are they still scared? Because if you can get here, you can go, shh, and it's payback time. Okay? That is the fear that keeps, that keeps racism alive in this country, is the idea that if, any, that, that if people of color got any real political power, they would wield it against the white underclass at that time, and it'd be hard to argue that the white people didn't have it coming. I mean, come on, you know? Um, so this story is, is, there's a lot of anger at the heart of this story, um, uh, but and bitterness, but I mean, do you blame the guy? I mean, come on, you know? And to even look at this, you know, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i old, but I'm not that old, okay? There was a lynching in my hometown 11 years before I was born in 1959. So this is living memory, okay? This is not ancient history. These things are, you know, I mean, these are around. So the story, at the heart of it, what makes the story still so vital, and certainly I encourage you to um, uh, to, to look at the stuff about um, about the Antifa and all that during Charlottesville um, and, and, and talk about that. Uh, but um, as you're thinking about writing about this story, certainly, um, uh, and looking forward to our final paper, the grandfathers of this story and the grandmother in another story, uh, those are those could be interesting uh, points of comparison and contrast. So just uh, throwing that out there. So um, otherwise, I will see you guys again in hyperspace. Have a good day.